Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakalpa Terubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhai Evacha Paditanam Pavane Vyo Vaishnavi Vyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasa De Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. <clears throat> okay, so let's review. Do you remember everything we studied yesterday? Krishna's response to Arjuna's question as to the symptoms of a self-realized soul. What was Krishna's response? Anyone remember? Nobody answers. Sorry? Not work, you have to perform your duty. Well, there's a verse, I think it's 259. Prajahati yada kaman sarvan parta manogatan atma nevat manatushta stita pragnas taduchati. Alright? It's something like that. Let me see. Arjuna's question is 54, so the answer is in 55. The symptom. Arjuna's question is to the symptoms. And Krishna responds, When a man gives up all varieties of desire for sense gratification, which arise from mental concoction, and when his mind, thus purified, find satisfaction in the self alone, then he is said to be in pure transcendental consciousness. So this is Lord Krishna's first reply. This is the, the actual symptoms of a self-realized soul, that he's free from the desire for sense gratification. His mind finds satisfaction in the self alone. So please note that. It's text number 55. That's the response, Krishna's first response. And then he goes on to describe other symptoms. Uh, Prabhupada spoke about what was most important. Do you remember what symptom was the most important? Speech, Maharaj. Speech, right. So how does a devotee speak? Will he do monavrat? Should he be silent? Oh, what should he do? How will a devotee of Krishna who is self-realized how will he speak? Yes, glorify the Lord. Yes, Manjuri Mahadev. Uh, he only speaks about uh, glories of Lord and related uh, topics. He does not speak about any material uh, objects or anything related to material. Non no nonsense at all. Okay. Yeah. All right. We, we, we spoke about our, our own experience. <coughs> we spoke about our own experiences of Param Dristva, the higher taste in Krishna consciousness. That when we really immerse ourselves in something, when we really become absorbed in doing something for Krishna, we transcend the demands of the body. We forget about eating and sleeping, and we can work so hard just because we're getting so much bliss 
we're getting so much pleasure out of service to Krishna. So that, that's one principle that <coughs> when we become really dedicated and really absorbed in trying to do something for Krishna, we transcend the demands of the body. And then reasons why the, and discuss the relevance of karma yoga being superior to karma sannyas. What, what was some of the, what, why, why is it superior to karma sannyas? What is one reason? not very clear for me, Prabhu, I'm sorry, what you were saying just didn't, it's not being, somehow, um, I don't know, maybe it's my microphone, I don't know how yours is, but it was... Maharaj, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, what, what I, I'm just trying to be loud here, I hope it's not uh, uh, disturbing. Uh, what, I, what I said was in uh, Karma Sanyas, uh, there is a, the, 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 because of not enough purification inside, there is a possibility of a fall down, but in case of a uh, Nishkam Karma Yogi, it's a slow gradual process and there is a better chances of success. Yeah, but you didn't identify any reasons why. Uh, Maharaj, uh, as soul is so active, uh, so uh, uh, by taking early sanya, uh, it becomes uh, passive and then uh, senses create the problem of due to the desires towards uh, the material objects. So, uh, so being active uh, in uh, yoga and joining with the Supreme, it's better to go for karma yoga, doing service. Yes, we need, we need to have proper engagement. There has to be some activity. We say the idle mind is the devil's workshop. And so karma sannyas, giving up work is all very well, but if one has not purified his existence by proper activities, then he will not be able to maintain that state of inertia or inactivity. How long can you give up work? The, the nature of the soul is to be active and we need activities. So the karma yogi will be engaged in all kinds of work for the service of Krishna. And if you read through the third chapter, we read about, now Lord Krishna gives two examples of liberated souls who also continued to work, although they were fully transcendental, they, they, they didn't need to work, but they continued to work. And the reason why they continued to work was they showed an example. So the example of the karma yogi is very important, that they're active, they're working. That example is very good for the common people. If the common people see everyone just doing nothing, sitting around and doing nothing, doesn't create a good impression. So the, the point about an, being an example for others is very important. Who knows what two examples, which two persons are identified as being, you know, very great souls. They didn't need to work, but still they worked. In chapter 3, yes? Yeah, the Janet Maharaj and Krishna uh, himself. Yes, right. Janet Maharaj and Lord Krishna himself. They both didn't need, they didn't need to do any work, but still they worked for the purpose of showing the right example to others. So that, that's an important point. The relevance of karma yoga being superior to karma sannyas. 
it just doesn't create the right example for others if everyone gives up work and does nothing. All right? we, become, we become parasites and simply living off others. Is this clear to everyone? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, we're going to go ahead. We're going to speak today about Sanatan Dharma. Yesterday, actually, some devotees brought up the topic about religion because Prabhupada had given the statement that religion without philosophy is sentiment and philosophy without religion is speculation. So here today, just coincidentally, we're going to discuss about Sanatan Dharma. Dharma actually means occupation. And we often, it's not exactly religion, but it's more occupation. And so we talk about Sanatana Dharma as our eternal occupation. The Lord is eternal and the living entities are all eternal. And we have our eternal occupation. And that is what Sanatana Dharma is. We have an intimate relationship with the Lord because we are all qualitatively one. The Sanatan Dharma or Sanatan Dham or Sky, the Sanatan Supreme Personality and the Sanatan Living Entities. The Lord descends to reclaim these fallen conditioned souls to call them back to the sanatana eternal sky so that the sanatana living entities may regain their eternal sanatana positions in eternal association with the Lord. The whole purpose of Bhagavad Gita is to revive our sanatana occupation or sanatan dharma, which is the eternal occupation of the living entity. That's from Srila Prabhupada's introduction to the Bhagavad Gita. So Prabhupada is describing, the <clears throat> defining to us actually sanatan dharma. It's the eternal occupation of the living entity. Yesterday I also gave some example which Srila Prabhupada had given us. He was describing the word Dharma and he said it's not exactly religion. You know, religion, when we, what is religion? Well, general, generally we speak about faith and faith, people's faith can change. Someone may be a Christian, they may be a Hindu, they may be a Buddhist or a Muslim, whatever. They can change their faith from one tradition to another. But this Dharma, this Sanatan Dharma, that doesn't change. That remains the same. It's our eternal occupation. So we want to understand this concept of Dharma. Prabhupada taught, taught the, the example, he said, just like the dharma of sugar is sweet and the dharma of chili is hot, in the same way living entities all have their dharma. If you like, we could describe it as nature, their nature. What is the nature of the living entity? And that nature, that dharma of the living entity is service. Because each and every living entity is engaged in some kind of service. The mother will serve her child. The soldier will serve his country. The worker will serve his company. Everyone's engaged in some kind of service or another. But the ultimate service is service to the Supreme Lord. And that is Sanatana Dharma. Other dharmas are not eternal. We know we come together as living entities, we come together in a country or in a family, 
but in course of time we're separated. So that is not eternal service. But our connection with the Supreme Lord, that is eternal. He is eternal and we as spiritual beings are also eternal. So on the spiritual platform, our eternal occupation is service to the Supreme Lord. This is a famous verse in the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Right? Very famous. Yada yadahi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata Adbhutanam adharmashya tadatmanam shijamya aham. Whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious practice, O descendant of Bharat, and a predominant rise of irreligion, at that time I descend myself. So the Lord comes at a particular time when there's particular need for him. When there's this decline in religious practice. Yada yadahi dharmasya Ganir bhavati bharata adbhutanam adharmasya adharmasya a rise of irreligion tadatmanam shri jamyaham at that time I manifest myself. So dharma samstapanartaya, the Lord comes to establish the actual religious principles to teach people what is actually the path. Right? Abhutanam, predominance, adharmashya, irreligion. So Kali Yuga, we're in that in this unfortunate situation. There's a predominance of irreligion. And what is actual religion is often described as irreligion. And what is often irreligion, people will accept it as being real religion. So it's very, very difficult in the Kali Yuga to establish what is actually religion. And here is the other verse, these two verses, very well known from the Bhagavad Gita. Paritranaya sadhunam vinas chaya chaduskritam Dharma samstarpanartaya sambhavami yuge yuge. So, Dharma samstarpanartaya sambhavami yuge yuge. Lord describes when he comes. First of all, what does he do when he comes? He comes to deliver the pious and to annihilate the miscreants. And he also comes to re establish the principles of religion. And the Lord said, I myself appear millennium after millennium. So you can see the Lord appearing. Sambhavami yuge yuge. Doesn't just come one time. Sometimes we say he's three yuga. He only comes in three yugas. But actually he says he comes in every age. Sambhavami yuge yuge. Millennium after millennium. And his mission in coming Dharma samstarpan artaya, to re-establish the principles of religion. Or, if you like, the principles of Dharma. And <laughs> Prabhupada explains there are different levels of principles of religion. There's, just like Prabhupada said, there's higher mathematics and very elementary mathematics. But in elementary ma mathematics, 1 plus 1 equals 2. And similarly, in very advanced mathematics, 1 plus 1 is still equal to 2. So whatever is taught in the elementary level of religion is also valid on the topmost level of religion. So the Lord's mission is to establish these principles of religion. We spoke yesterday, what are the principles of religion? If you read Srimad Bhagavatam, in Srimad Bhagavatam it's described when Maharaj Pariksit was ruling the kingdom, ruling the earth, 
he was traveling around the earth and he was making sure everyone was following religious principles. But it happened that one time he was shocked to see that someone was dressed in the form of a king. And this person was clearly not of a Kshatriya nature. He was actually like a Sudra or lower, but he was dressed like a king and he had a sword in his hand and he was chastising the bull and the cow and the bull was standing on only a portion of one leg. So the mother cow represents the earth and the bull represents dharma or the principles of religion. And just as there are four legs on the bull, there are four principles of religion. Satyam, Sojam, Daya and Tapa. Satyam, truthfulness, Sojam, cleanliness, Daya, mercy and Tapa, austerity. So these four principles are the basic principles of religion. But there's also higher principles of religion. That is just simply elementary principles of religion. Keeping clean, being merciful, t being truthful, and do doing some austerity. All right? So, for the purpose of establishing the principles of religion, the Lord is describing His purpose in appearing. The, the Lord comes Himself, the Supreme Lord, the Personality of Godhead, Bhagavan Sri Krishna, personally comes to establish the principles of religion. And how does He do that? He does it by speaking the Bhagavad Gita. This is from Srila Prabhupada's purport to this, this verse, the same verse in the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. The principles of Dharma or religion are the direct orders of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. These principles are clearly indicated throughout the Bhagavad Gita. The Lord directly orders at the end of the Gita that the highest principle of religion is to surrender unto Him only and nothing more. Right? So here Prabhupada is telling us what is the highest principle of religion. I was telling you what is the, the elementary principles of religion. Cleanliness, mercy, austerity, truthfulness. That is elementary. But the highest principle of religion is to surrender unto Lord Sri Krishna only and nothing more. Later when we come to the 18th chapter, you will hear what is the meaning of surrender. It's described in Srila Prabhupada's purport. There are six principles which are connected with the surrender of the soul to Lord Krishna. So, we're going to speak now about the re following what is called Varnashram Dharma. Earlier we had spoken about the principles of dividing society, that there are four Varnas and there are four Ashramas, right? The four Varnas, meaning the four occupations, Brahman, Kshatri, Vaishya, Sudra. And the four ashrams, sannyasi, vanaprastha, grihastha, brahmachari. So these divisions of society are there for the purpose of organizing society. People should be guided according to their different psychophysical natures. Some people have the nature to be Vaishya. They're always thinking about doing business and buying and selling and they have the Vaishya tendency. Someone else by nature may be Kshatriya. 
they're a they're an administrator they're a manager they're like to control and they're good at uh, giving shelter and protecting others and they're kind-hearted and generous this is kshatri and then the brahmana the brahmana his duty is to study shastra and teach shastra to worship the deity and to teach others to worship the deity and they can also accept charity and they can give charity. So these are the occupations of a brahmana which they're meant to be engaged in. It's sometimes pointed out that it's unfortunate that in the Kali Yuga, in this age, brahmanas today are expert in only one of these six occupations. Which, which occupation do you think the brahmanas are most expert in? Would anyone like to say? Accept charity. Sorry? Yes, Prabhupada. What did the Prabhu say? Vaishya. No, I, it, I gave six occupations, six activities. Which one is the brahmana most expert in? I mentioned six different occupations, teaching the scriptures and studying the scriptures, worshipping the deity and teaching others to worship the deity, accepting charity and giving charity. Which one are they most expert in? Yes, except they're expert in taking the charity. Yes, they will come and they will want the charity. This is remarked even 500 years ago, it was like that. So, the Krishna Consciousness Movement wants to, shed, to set a higher standard. We don't want to create brahmanas like that who just simply have the motive to live off others. <coughs> Rather, the brahmanas must be self-sufficient. They should be able to live very, very simply, to minimize the demand, their demands and their needs, and to give the greatest benefit to others by their teaching. Right? Okay, so here's a statement from the scriptures. Kovarta apto bhajata swadharmata. A non devotee fully engaged in his occupational duties does not gain anything. Do you believe it? Do you believe this? A non-devotee, fully engaged in his duty, occupational duty, does not gain anything. From Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, fifth chapter, meaning Narada Muni instructing Srila Vyasa Dev. Maharaj, I think it's half verse. Sorry? What did you it say? Is ha ha it is half of it, half verse. Of course, yes, yeah, it's only half of the verse, yes. What's the other half? You want to read it for us? Uh, I don't have it handy, but it says that even the devotee who engages in uh, devotional service is not complete, he's still. Uh, better even if he's not doing his uh, swadharma he's not able to do his swadharma so mm. devotional service is highest uh, something like that yes well we're we're here we're speaking about non-devotees we point we just want to point out about non-devotees at this point okay. someone who's not a devotee that even though they may do their duty according to vanashram but they don't actually gain anything. 
You may say, oh no, I get paid, I get my salary. Yeah. <laughs> but ultimately, what do you gain in, in terms of eternal existence, in, in terms of your eternal existence as a spiritual being? What is your position? Anyway, since Mataji brought it up, we'll read the rest of the verse. It's also quoted in Bhagavad Gita. You can see in three places it's there in text two, chapter 2, text 40, chapter 3, text 5, and chapter 6, verse 40. So it's really quoted three times. Very important verse. Chakvasva dharmam charanam bhajam Translation. If someone takes to Krishna consciousness, even though he may not follow the prescribed duties in the Shastras or execute the devotional service properly, and even though he may fall down from his uh, standard, there is no loss or evil for him. But if, if he carries out all the injunctions for purification in the Shastras, what does it avail to him if he is not Krishna conscious. So this is the point. It's a very important verse for us as devotees because of course we've come to Krishna consciousness and there will be challenges, there, there will be difficulties, we may not be successful. But Srila Sri Narada Muni is encouraging all of us that if that even we come to Krishna consciousness, that there's no loss or diminution. And we heard, we were studying that verse previously, uh, uh, that a little advancement made saves us from the, the greatest danger. Swopam api asya dharmasya trayate mahatobhaya. A little advancement made. So, but if you don't have any Krishna consciousness and you simply do your duties, you don't gain anything. There's no benefit to you. So, you may follow Varnashram Dharma, but if you're not Krishna, if you're not becoming self-realized, if you're not developing Krishna consciousness, there's no benefit. It's useless. Srila Prabhupada explains, the animals, they have no regulative principles, but human society must follow regulative principles. That is called Varnashram Dharma. So Varnashram Dharma is also material. That is not spiritual. From Srimad Bhagavatam lecture in Calcutta, 1974, lecturing on first canto, second chapter, verse number six. So Varnashram Dharma is a material activity. Following the principles of Varnashram is not spiritual. So what is the benefit of following Varnashram Dharma? Can anyone say? Yes, sir. What, what, what benefit do you get from following Varnashram Dharma? Purification of the senses and gradual elevation to higher standards. Yes, where did you get that from? Where are you reading from? So I've, uh, uh, I've already read Maharaj, so I didn't know uh, the quote. I've read from Srila Prabhupada Sandhi, but I don't know from Vanish. Anyway, it's, uh, you, you have to, I, it helps us if you can give us from Prabhupada's purports. 
It's actually there. If you look in text number uh, second chapter 31, 32, 37, and 46, you will find different references about the benefit of following Varnashram Dharma. Right? Why don't you just take a few minutes and just go through these purports on this section. Lord Krishna did speak about Varnashram Dharma. Do you remember? It was in the section of the second chapter. So it begins with 31. Everyone please look at your Bhagavad Gita's. Give me some reasons from the purport of text 31. Why th there's some benefit in practicing Varnashram Dharma. Hare Krishna Maharaj, in verse 31, I could find on the bodily uh, plane, Swadharma is called Varnashram Dharma or man's stepping stone for the spiritual understanding. As you said just now that uh, Varnashram Dharma is a materialistic thing, but the thing is, if you don't follow that, there is no scope for you to be, you know, stepping higher into your spiritual development. So that could be one. Okay, you're, that's correct there, Prabhupada, that's mentioned this, stepping stones for spiritual advancement. Now, although Varnashram Dharma is material, the, it, it does serve as some stepping stones for making progress to the spiritual platform, right? So that's there in 31. Is there another point there in 31? Yes, Maharaj, in the end, uh, discharging one's specific duty in any field of action in accordance, accordance with the order of higher authorities serves to elevate one to the higher state of life. Yes, right. That's also there, text number 31, purport, right at the end, that it, ele it can elevate us to a higher status in the material world, right? For example, can you give some example how people would be elevated? Maraji. Maharaj, the uh, example is just in the uh, you know next verse that is 32, where Lord Arjuna is, uh, you know, where Sri Krishna is telling to Arjuna that uh, if he conquers his enemy, he would enjoy the kingdom. And if he should die in the battle, he would be elevated to the heavenly planets. Lord Krishna is saying that you are a Kshatriya, you know, so your dharma is to fight. And if you're going to fight, then you are going to advance, uh, you know, spiritually. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, uh, people will scorn you for not fighting. Yes, but coming back to 31, we were talking about being elevated to a higher status. It's there for this sacrifice, animal sacrifice by the Brahmins. The animal get directly human body, direct elevation. Okay, what about human beings? Human beings, there is... Can, how, do, how are human beings elevated to a higher status? Khatriyas, if he kills in the battlefield, he attains the heavenly planet. Yes, but even on this planet, one can be elevated to a higher status. Marat, by discharging their specific duties. Yes. So, how do we... But I just wanted to hear how, in what way people could maybe elevate to a higher status. I so think, if, yes, go ahead. If, if I'm a, like, a, like a Vaishya mentality, so I'll be doing a business way better than the Brahman, Kshatriya and Sudra because my intellect and psycho, psycho, psychological nature is more involved and better equipped to earn money rather than administrating it or doing service to someone else. And similarly, Kshatriya will be much better administrator or leader than a sutra, mentality people. That's what 
Yes, yeah, th th yeah, this is the point that I'm thinking about, right, that the status in terms of caste, in terms of varna, that generally we think of the brahmana as being the head of the social body, and the kshatriya, he is the administrator, the vaishya would be under them, the sudra is under the vaishya, like that. And so if one may be sudra, but if he follows Varnashram, he can be he may become a Vaishya. The Vaishya, he can be elevated, he may become Kshatriya. The Kshatriya, he may be elevated, he be can become a, a Brahmana. That is elevating our, to a higher status of life. Ramayana, Mar yes? Mar Mar is forbidden in society. This social transmigration is forbidden. Because Sudra cannot be a Brahmana or Kshatriya. A sudra cannot be a brahman or kshatriya? No elevation is possible in our social system. Huh? In what? In our social system, doesn't uh, recognize the elevation from one burner to another. Yes, but we're talking about Krishna conscious. And, and on the, in the regular society, just by simply practicing Varnashram Dharma, the strict follower, following of Varnashram Dharma is not based on birth, but it's based on guna and karma. That is described in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, I am the creator of these divisions of society and I created, I created them according to guna and karma. Chatur Varnam Maya Shistam Guna Karma Vibhagasha. Krishna created these divisions not by birth. That is not the proper application of Varnashram Dharma. So if one practices the principles of Varnashram Dharma and follows them strictly, one can be elevated to a higher status. And the higher status would be to come to the position like Vaishya or Kshatriya or even Brahmana. And we, we, we read about Vishwamitra, he was Kshatriya, he became Brahmana, he became Brahmarishi, right? And so it's possible. One should be known not by birth, but by his guna and karma. So elevate to a higher status is there in 31. And then there's some point in 32, you've already mentioned in 32, what were the points? What's the benefit of following Varnashram? Described in 32, tell me again. Swarga Dwaram Apavritam. Yes, Swarga Dwaram Apavritam, opening the doors to the heavenly planets. And that's if he if he uh, fails in the battle, but on the other hand, he may win the battle, and so he could enjoy, conquer and enjoy the kingdom. Either way, by following Varnashram, both things are possible. Oh, actually, that's th 37, conquering and enjoying the, the, the kingdom. That's in text number 37, you could conquer and enjoy the heavenly kingdom. But Swarga, Swarga Dwaram Apavritam is there in 32. And what, ab what about 46? Chapter 2, text 46. What's the benefit of following Varnashram? Maharaj, by following the Varnashram Dharam properly, as we have just discussed that one can be elevated and one can become a self-realized soul. And a self-realized soul means understanding Krishna and one's internal relationship with Him. Yes, very good, right. Gradual development to self-realization. That's mentioned in the purport of text number 46. Gradual development to self-realization. 
understanding we're not the body okay so those benefits are there for Varnashram now we're going to talk about Krishna consciousness because in Krishna consciousness well let's first of all look at the benefits of practicing Krishna consciousness here text number 40 from the second chapter all right. Niha bhikrama nashosti prat yavayo navidyate svalpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahatopayat. In this endeavor, there's no loss or diminution, and a little advancement on this path can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. Right? What is the fear? What is that fear? Death. Not just death. Everyone has to die. What's Repeated the? Repeated birth and death. Huh? Repeated birth and death. Right? Well, that's there for everyone in the material world. But there's something. There's some very special danger. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, going in again 84 like Yonis or species repeating that cycle yes and particularly going where what where should we be most afraid of going Hell. The, go, no, going no, no, into no. the lower species of life yeah. entering into the lower species the animal species or the plant or the trees like that that, that is very dangerous to enter into those kind of species. If we are so sinful, if we are so covered by the material energy, you know, just like in Damodar Leela, you had uh, the two sons of Kuvera, Nalikriva and Nala Kuvera, they became trees and they had to stand as trees. That is, oh, that is a great punishment, a very severe punishment. So to be put into the body of a tree, it's very dangerous. We should be very afraid of losing the human form of life. So if we, if, if we can help people to make a little advancement on this path, then this can save us from that kind of fear. Prabhupada says, activity in Krishna consciousness or acting for the benefit of Krishna without expectation of sense gratification is the highest transcendental quality of work. Even a small beginning of such activity finds no impediment, nor can that small beginning be lost at any stage. So Prabhupada is uh, praising the efforts of someone to take up Krishna consciousness. But Prabhupada mentions that, that what should be the mood that we act simply for the benefit of Krishna without any thought of anything in return. That is the highest quality of work. And if we, can be, if we can even have a small beginning of that mood, then it's very praiseworthy. Prabhupada continues, Work in Krishna consciousness carries a person again to Krishna consciousness, even after the loss of the body. At least one is sure to have a chance in the next life of being born again as a human being, and that will give one a further chance for elevation. From the purport of the second chapter, text number 40. So what are the benefits of practicing Krishna consciousness? Tell me some. Maharaj, in the purpose, uh, in the verse 40, it says, 
a work begin in Krishna consciousness has a permanent effect, even though not finished. So in the, uh, you know, and it says that Krishna consciousness carries a person again to Krishna consciousness even after the loss of the body. So there is no fall down for the person in Krishna consciousness. For example, if your practice has been a little incomplete in this birth, then next uh, you will be given a human uh, birth, maybe in the, uh, you know, family of a great cultured Brahman or in aristocratic family where you will be a given chance of further development. So a little work done will also be carried forward. It will, uh, you know, uh, not be diminished. Okay. Yes. Any other benefits of practicing? Uh, Maharaj, yes. Maharaj, Maharaj, our human birth is assured. Uh, I'm next sorry. Life, next life, we'll get a human birth. That is for sure. Okay. We will not be degraded. We don't get any benefit in this life. If we take up Krishna Consciousness, we, we have to wait for the next life before we get benefit? We won't get any benefit now? Are you saying? Yeah, yeah we will get, this life also will be elevated, we will be peaceful. This life will be elevated where? Elevated in Krishna Consciousness towards that goal, we will walk few steps in that direction if it is not completed. What is, what are some of the ways, how does it actually come about that we are benefited by practicing Krishna consciousness in this life? Prasadam odigachati, something, we will attain peacefulness. Uh-huh. But there's something more which you haven't quite identified yet, which we're getting... Uh, sorry. In verse 41, it says, when one is situated in Krishna consciousness, all activities are on the absolute plane, for they are no longer subjected to the dualities like good and bad. Okay. No longer subjected to, to the dualities. Uh, there's still something more I want, I'd like to hear from you that, that there's one point more which is very important which is really the, uh, the potency of Krishna Consciousness. We discussed... Yes, Prabhu? Renunciation of the material conception of the life. Yes, but the, and how does that come about? How do we get that in order to develop that kind of mood about to give up material life? It, association of pure devotees, Maharaj? Yeah, uh, what is the effect of association of pure devotees? A strong faith. No, you're not getting... My point is, which I wanted to hear from you, is that it frees us from sinful reactions. Have you heard that before? By practice of Krishna Consciousness, it destroys past sins. Our past sinful activities, the reactions which we are suffering, they're all removed. The seeds of sinful desires are all removed by devotional service. Is it technically called as a Klesh Agni Maharaj? Klesh Agni. Well, anyway, let me put it into English. I'm not so familiar with Klesh Agni. What is it you're talking about? The, the burning of the miseries, burning up the miseries? One is immediately relieved from all types of suffering. Okay, but you don't get that. You, you, you have to get, understand why you're getting relief from suffering. Because it's destroying the sinful reactions. When we engage in pure devotional service, it will burn up the seeds of sinful activities. This is described in the Nectar of Devotion, in the very first two chapters of the Nectar of Devotion. Srila Prabhupada writes about this, how there are different stages of sinful desires. There is Kuta and Bija, 
there is parabdha karma and there is aparabdha karma. And by practice of devotional service, we destroy all four stages of sinful reactions. That is the benefit of Krishna consciousness. Just like when we go around Tosi, we're chanting, right? That yani kani chapa pani, brahmahatya dikani, even the killing of the brahmana, even the reactions which come from killing a brahmana can be removed by circumambulating the Tosi tree. Of course, it doesn't mean we go around killing brahmanas, but the potency of chanting, the potency of worshipping the Lord, the potency of worshipping Tosi and chanting the holy name is that it destroys sinful reactions. And we all have sinful reactions. We're all here in this material world. And we bring with us sinful reactions. And this body is the result of our sinful activities. But we can purify ourselves by practicing Krishna consciousness. Right? Of course, this is also discussed in the Srimad Bhagavatam, particularly in relation to the pastime of Ajamila. And Ajamila, he's chanting the name of his son and how he got relief from all of his sins. All right? Work in Krishna consciousness carries a person again to Krishna consciousness, even after the loss of the body. At least one is sure to have a chance in the next life being born as a human being, and that will give one a further chance for elevation. Okay, group exercise for you. How many people are here in the class today? 44, Maharaj. Huh? 44, 44. 44, okay. So, how many groups can we have? 11, 11 groups of four. And the first question is, under what circumstances following Varnashram Dharma is necessary? And then, second question, what are the qualifications required for beginning practice of Krishna consciousness? Give support from Bhagavad Gita 231, 35, 326, and 335. Right? So you're four people in a group. You can each take one verse and you can analyze and pick out the proper references to answer these two questions. All right? So don't take too long. But how long will we give you? How, how much time do you think you need? Ten minutes? Okay. We'll give you ten minutes. So, who is going to check the time? We want someone to check the time and have everyone back in after ten minutes. All right? Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hare Krishna, uh, I'm not in any room, it says that. Hare Krishna. Um, Hare Krishna, how are you here? <laughs> yeah, we are in the group with Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Oh, Maharaj is blessed. <laughs> I'm in the group here, eh? okay. Is it correct? Wait, I mean, the, the Prabhuji is... Uh, Divided it incorrectly, or? Well, 
Don't worry about it. Just let's look at the question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, first question is under what circumstances following Varashrama Dharma is necessary? Now, there are four verses we have to look at, right? Yes. The. 231? 231? Chapter 231. Okay. Uh, 231. Okay. And three verses from chapter 3. 5, 26, and 35. Yes. Okay, so which verse? We have to take one verse each. Okay. I will take 335, last one. Okay, I'll take 35. I'll take Krishna, so I have read the 3.5, which is here, I found the circumstances of following Manasrama Dharma is actually um, the spirit soul has to be engaged in the good work of Krishna consciousness. Uh, otherwise, it will be engaged in occupations detected by the illusory energy because uh, the body is only that vehicle to be worked by the spiritual soul which is always active and cannot stop even for a moment so that's related to the Varnasrama Dharma based on the uh, 
Bhagavad Gita chapter 3.5. So what are you saying? When in answer, to reply, how are you responding to the first question? Are you are you responding to the first question? At, yes, yes. At what point I, one can give up Vanashram Dharma, is it? Or who who is who can give up Vanashram Dharma? Um, not give up Varna Srama Dharma. I mean, uh, from this um, text, actually, um, the spirit soul has to be engaged in the occupation, I mean, uh, engaged in the good work of Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, it will be engaged in the occupation dictated by the illusory energy. So, that's the relations to the first question, I think. What is the first question? Do you have a copy of it? Yes. Under what circumstances following Varanasrama Dharma is necessary? All right. Under what circumstances following Varnashram Dharma is necessary? Mm. So if, if one is Krishna conscious, does he have to follow Varnashram Dharma? Yes. Did you read that? Did you did didn't didn't you read the purport? What did it say? Let's say if one is Krishna conscious, if one is engaged in Krishna consciousness, does he have to follow Vanashram? Actually, in this text, no. One is Krishna consciousness is spiritual, so. Did Prabhupada follow Varnashram Dharma? Maharaj, can we say that Krishna consciousness is about all the Vartas in Ashrams? Sorry? It's great. Can, I, can we say that Krishna consciousness is performing, Krishna consciousness is our all Vartas in Ashrams? Following Krishna consciousness? Well, Above, above, it's higher? Yes, Krishna yeah. consciousness okay. is transcendental, right. Krishna consciousness yeah. is transcendental to Varnashram. But yeah. did, did Lord Chaitanya follow Varnashram? Um. He was a sannyasi. Was he a strict sannyasi? Yes, he was very strict. Yes, he was a very strict sannyasi. Yeah. Right? And was he a strict grihasta? Yes, he was. He performed very nicely. Yeah, and was did, was, was Prabhupada? He was perfect. Was Prabhupada? Uh, did, was Prabhupada following Varnashram? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, he, he was, performed when he was the first Maharaj. He performed his duty perfectly well, and then when he became a sannyasi, he he followed his ashram very perfect, yeah, perfectly well. Right. And he followed Varnashram, but he's, he's devotee, he's Krishna conscious, right? Yeah. He doesn't need to follow Varnashram, but he did it. He did it. He did follow. So what we can say about this marriage? Well, what's the question? Oh, question is, uh, we are soon going to break out. Um, Maharaj, can I give my one? Um, it says that it's, uh, it's uh, 335. It says that when one is under the spell of hopes of material nature, one should follow prescribed rules for his particular situation and should not imitate others. So it says that um, in Krishna consciousness, rather than performing others' duty. Recording in progress. This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Oh, this is another breakout room. <laughs> yes, we're all back in the main room. Oh, okay. Okay. The, 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 we're, the breakout rooms are all finished. We're all closed. Okay. We're back in the main room. <laughs> we had our ten minutes. Ten minutes fast. Went so fast. <laughs> Yeah, went very fast. Okay, here's the question again. 
Oh, Krishna. Here's the questions again. Under what circumstances following Varnashram Dharma is necessary? Does anyone have, would anyone like to take up the response to this first question? Yes, Maharaj, uh, our group has come to the point. Okay. What group number are you? Group six to number six. Uh huh. Go ahead, Prabhu. Under Maharaj, uh, we, do, we require to fo follow the Varnashram Dharma till uh, we are liberated uh, from the bodily concept of life. Uh, uh, till we uh, become istraigunu. Until we become liberated, we should follow Varnashram Dharma. Right. Okay. From the stage of istraigunu. Okay. Did Lord Chaitanya follow Varnashram? No. Maharaj, he told that it is external. Do you, do you mean he didn't follow Varnashram? Was Lord, Chaitan, was Lord Chaitanya not a strict sannyasi? He's the greatest sannyasi, Maharaj. Huh? Greatest, greatest sannyasi. So, how can you say he didn't follow Varnashram? He told that this is Iha Bhatya. But it, that, that, that didn't mean don't follow it. He was asking Ram, Ramananda Roy a question. He asked Ramananda Roy a, a question about the, the ultimate goal of life, the, ult, the highest purpose of religion from the scriptures. And when Ramananda Roy quoted Varnashram, he said that is external. But he never said that we don't have to follow it. Maybe Maharaj, it is, uh, it is uh, within the material conception of life on the Varnasram. But, but it may be between in the material conception of life. But that doesn't mean that we don't follow. Did Prabhupada follow Varnasram? Krishna Maharaj, can I answer? Yes. I'm from room one, Maharaj. Oh, you're in from, from uh, another 31, group. 31 copper, when uh, even a Kshatriya should follow for giving the protection, because Kshatriya means itself is those who are uh, hurt and giving protection. For Brahmana, uh, it is for like uh, sacrificing animals uh, is the, uh, when that is need, that time it is needed. Even for the, uh, high, uh, to elevate one to the higher platform of life, uh, under higher authorities, to serve higher authorities, they have to follow uh, Well, you're, you're taking us away from the topic, you know. I was already discussing something else and you've come on a completely different topic, you know. No, Varnashram is must uh, to follow even coming to Krishna consciousness, but first we have to fill the duty towards uh, Swadharma. Our, so that is... So, must for even Krishna so I was asking, did Srila Prabhupada follow Varnashram? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yes. Did Lord Chaitanya follow Varnashram? Yes, yes he was a uh, great sannyasi. He followed all, uh, even he was a good grihastha also. Yes, right. So the, the point is, even the, the great devotees, they strictly follow Varnashram. Because it's, although it's external, but it's part of the Vedic culture. Hmm? What, what their consciousness internally is different. As you say, we have our Swadharma. But still, the, the principles of Varnashram Dharma are there, and everyone follows them. And who, who especially needs to follow Varnashram? Uh, Prabhupada mentions those who are on material platform should follow uh, Varnashram Dharma. Right. The right? Liberated, they should be following the Varnashram. And we spoke about how by following Varnashram, they can elevate their status. They can 
purify their existence. They can become sets of following Varnashram. They're not liberated, but they can be greatly benefited by following Varnashram. And those who are liberated souls follow Varnashram because the example is very important. Right? So then we ask, what are the qualified consciousness? Anyone with the desire of inclination can start it. Yes, there's no prerequisite. There's no special qualification required for beginning practice. Simply one has must be sincere and have the genuine desire to practice Krishna consciousness and to be willing to take instruction and to be guided, then they can be allowed to practice Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness is, there's no restriction. It's not like we have some, oh, you have to be high caste, oh, you have to be at least Vaishya, Kshatriya, or Brahman before you can become a devotee in Krishna consciousness. No. Or uh, we may say, oh, you have to be educated, you have to be a college graduate. No. You have to be able to read and write. No. What you do have to be, you do have to do, you have to be sincere and you have to be genuine in your desire to want to practice Krishna consciousness. And you're willing to take instruction and to be guided by others. So that is the nature of Krishna consciousness. Going ahead, Varnashram, really plain, Swadharma is called Varnashram Dharma or man's stepping stone for spiritual understanding of Varnashram Dharma. Very important. Human civilization begins from the stage of. Of course, in the modern times, we don't have any. But did want. I thought that within our Krishna Consciousness movement, that we can show people how nice Varnashram Dharma. In other words, within our Krishna Consciousness movement, although we don't designate people as Brahman, Kshatri, Vaishya, Sudra, we do have designations of the ashrams because we're a spiritual society. We're not, you know, we're not uh, concerned with the ashrams. So we see the different ashrams there in our Krishna consciousness movement. And that's one way of organizing society. Dharma allows that, to recognize the nature of people and to engage them according to their nature. So on the bodily plane, Swadharma is called Varnashram Dharma. Our actual nature is recognized by our position in the Varna and Ashrams. And the whole purpose of the Varna and Ashrams is meant for spiritual understanding, that it will help to bring us to a higher consciousness. In text 31, purport, second chapter, as long as one is not liberated, one has to perform the duties of his particular body in accordance with religious principles in order to achieve liberation. When one is liberated, one swadharma, or specific duty, becomes spiritual and is not in the material bodily concept. So uh, the swadharma is it, it changes, it can become spiritual. When we are conditioned, it's on the bodily platform. But when we become liberated, then our swadharma becomes spiritual. And this is the idea. We want to come to the higher consciousness. 
we have we want to become liberated and it's possible the principles of varnashram help us to gradually achieve purification but Krishna consciousness itself is more powerful. If we simply follow Varnashram, you have to follow Varnashram for a long time before you could ever really elevate yourself. But in Krishna consciousness, we can very quickly get the benefit. Srila Prabhupada explains from the purport of the third chapter, text number 26. A slightly developed Krishna conscious person may directly be engaged in the service of the Lord without waiting for other Vedic formulas. For this fortunate man, there is no need to follow the Vedic rituals because by direct Krishna consciousness, one can have all the results one would otherwise derive from following one's prescribed duties. So, Srila Prabhupada is mentioning here, we don't need to do all these uh, Vedic rituals and follow the, all the principles of the Varnashram. If we simply become Krishna conscious, then we can get all of the benefits in one blow. That it's so much easier, much more effective. Simply become Krishna conscious. Take up the service of Krishna. Hearing and chanting, worshipping, all of the activities which devotees are engaged in. We do everything in Krishna consciousness and we'll do everything, whatever is required. We don't mind. We won't say, oh, I'm a Brahmana, I cannot clean. You know, on, on, on the material platform, the Brahmana, he won't take the brush and sweep the floor and he won't go and clean the toilets or so on, wash the pot. He said, I'm a Brahmana, I can't do that. But a devotee, he'll do whatever is required for the service of Krishna. That is Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness is transcendental to Varnashram. The devotee of Krishna will do anything and everything for the service of Krishna. Without question. He just simply wants to please Krishna. And Krishna notes that, that surrender of the devotee. But in Varnashram, you know, oh, I'm a, I'm a Brahman, oh, I'm Kshatriya, I'm Vaishya. Like we all have our, each one has their own uh, restrict what they're going to do. So we said Prabhupada followed Varnashram, Lord Chaitanya followed Varnashram, in the sense that they were strict in their ashrams. They, were, they strictly followed their ashrams, going preaching and not accumulating things, living very simply. They were very renounced and they were very strict in, the, in Grihastha life also, in their Grihastha life taking care of their family. Lord Chaitanya took care of his mother and his wife. When Srila Prabhupada had his wife and children, he took care of them. His father also, like that. So in, in Grihastha life, they followed the principles and then they went on to renounce the world and they followed the principles in the higher ashram. But uh, it's not that they had to follow all the principles of Varnashram Dharma. The, the rituals, they didn't have to do all the rituals, the Vedic rituals. There were things which Prabhupada did which usually sannyasis would not do. For example, Vedic culture says sannyasi is not meant to cross the ocean. But Prabhupada crossed the ocean. If he didn't cross the ocean, how could he go to America? But the Vedic culture was like that, that sannyasi is not supposed to cross the ocean. Sannyasi is not to, supposed to wear sewn cloth. 
sannyasis not supposed to uh, talk to any woman, no woman can come near. But for preaching, Srila Prabhupada would, would do all of these things. He encouraged many lady devotees in their preaching. Very elevated matages like Yamuna and Malati Maharaji, and they were very advanced ladies. Prabhupada engaged them in Krishna consciousness. So Prabhupada did things which were surprising people, like bringing deities to the West and establishing deities in the Western countries where there's no Ganga water. Prabhupada didn't worry about these things, the Vedic rituals. He simply worried about Krishna consciousness, being Krishna conscious. That's the important thing. All right, so here's another statement by Prabhupada. So at the present moment, there is no possibility of persons following the principles of Varnashram Dharma, either here or anywhere. Everyone is Varna Sankara, Kalo Sudra Sambhavaha. Varna Sankara meaning unwanted population. And Kalo Sudra Sambhava, in this age, Kali Yuga, everyone is by birth Sudra. In this age, everyone is a Sudra. Nobody is a Brahmana. Nobody is Kshatriya. Nobody is Vaishya, Sudra. So in this age, you won't find anyone following the Varnashram Dharma. Now, you cannot again introduce this system of Varnashram. It is not possible. But if one takes to Krishna consciousness, automatically he becomes immediately a Brahmana and above the Brahmana. A Vaishnava is above the Brahmana. Prabhupada's lecture on Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3, verses 18 to 30, in Los Angeles, 1968. So Prabhupada is describing that there's nobody's following Varnashram Dharma in this age. You can't, can't, and we cannot reintroduce it. But if we take to Krishna consciousness, then immediately he can take the position of a Brahmana and become even more than the Brahmana. Uh, Prabhupada pointed out, he thought, he said, just like in universities, they have departments where they teach subjects like Greek or Latin. You know, it, these languages are dead languages. They're not spoken anymore, and not used much. But still, they keep the departments in the university. So Prabhupada said, in the same way, we should try to keep the elements of Varnashram within the society keep some elements to show people how effective this method is for organizing society. For example, the ashrams and how, you know, people in the beginning, they're students and then they enter into family life and then from family life they retire and then after retirement they may even go on to renounce. So that is the arrangement of society for spiritual progress and the different occupations according to the different natures. You have the intellectual, the brahmana, you have the administrator, the kshatriya, you have the mercantile class of people, the vaishya, and you have the worker, the sudra. So everywhere in the world you find these four different occupations. It's not just only in India. It's all everywhere in the world. Prabhupada went to Russia. Prabhupada saw in Russia, at that time Russia was communist, it was socialist. And Prabhupada saw someone is sweeping the street and someone is riding in the car. 
So can you say everyone is equal? One person is riding the car and other person is sweeping the road. We cannot say everyone is equal. They have different duties, different occupations. So therefore, in the world everywhere, there are four different occupations. These four divisions are there, naturally. It's the arrangement of Lord Krishna Himself. All right, so we're going to look at what we covered today. We spoke about the appearance of Lord Krishna to establish Dharma. When Lord Krishna comes, he comes in every age. His mission is to re-establish, right? To give pleasure to the devotees, kill the demons, and re-establish the principles of religion. Why does he need to re-establish the principles of religion? What happened to them? Who can say? To retain the fallen souls, Maharaj. No, no, no. What happened? Why did Krishna have to come and re-establish the principles of religion? Krishna had given the same instruction to Sun God the millions of years back, but uh, over a period of time, the principles of uh, religion, they get to So that's why Krishna wanted to re-establish. <coughs> yeah, in course of time, they became lost, right? Yoga nashta parantapa. What happened? Why did they be, why were they lost? Yes, why were they lost? What happened to the principles of religion? Yeah, over a period of time it was lost and adharma came up, so principles of irreligion were uh, on rise. Why? There was no proper Guru Parampara. Mm, maybe. Discipline association was broken. Yeah, maybe. Yes. Because there was a rise in irreligion due to demonic personalities in the world. Sorry, not clear. Maharaj, because there was a rise in irreligion due to the demonic personalities in the world. Oh, okay, demonic people in the world. Well, the demons in the world, are they promoting religion? No, Maharaj. They're, they're promoting irreligion, right? The demons, they're promoting their irreligious activities. But Krishna came, he established Dharma, he brought the principles of religion. But in course of time, somehow they were lost. They were lost. One reason could be that people changed. They began to deviate from the original teachings. The actual teachings which were given in the beginning became uh, became twisted and became, became distorted, the pure message was lost. And when you change something, then there's no more potency anymore. If the principles, are, if, if we change anything, it won't have the same effect. And this is what happens. Although Krishna comes and establishes the principles of religion, but in course of time, People introduce, they think they know better, they have ideas, and they make changes, they make alterations, and ultimately the whole thing becomes useless. And then Krishna has to come again. He has to come and re-establish the principles. Okay, and then the ultimate principle of Dharma, surrender to Krishna. The ultimate principle, right? We spoke about elementary mathematics and higher mathematics. So this is the ultimate principle, which is surrender to Krishna, that Krishna comes to teach that. By speaking Bhagavad Gita, he not only tells Arjuna, 
but he encourages all of us to surrender to him. Give up all other dharmas. Yesterday we spoke about that a little bit because the Lord Krishna says, Sarva dharma, Sarva dharma parigyajna mamikam sharanam. And he says, give up all your dharmas. So these dharmas are these subordinate dharmas and take up the real dharma, which is to surrender to Krishna. Other dharmas may be, oh, I'm a householder, I have to take care of my family. Other dharmas may be, oh, I have to work, I have to study, I have this to do, I have that to do. You know, we have our own ideas about what is important in life, but the ultimate principle of religion is to surrender to Krishna. And all the other things, all the other dharmas, just like, oh, but I want to be non-violent, you want, like Buddhism, they teach ahimsa as the ultimate principle of religion, that's a sub-religious principle. It's not the most important principle of religion. We spoke earlier about utilizing violence even in the service of Krishna. So the ultimate principle of religion is not ahimsa, and it's not practicing brahmacharya, and it's not uh, just living on vegetables and fruit, but it's surrendering to Krishna. And then we define the phrase sanatan dharma. Does anyone remember how did we define the phrase sanatan dharma? Sanatan means eternal, dharma means religion. So we have to, uh, we are part and parcel of Krishna. So we have to serve Krishna in that. Yeah, anybody, Madam, anyone else? Uh, for the first point, I just want to say something that appearance of Krishna is due to forgetfulness of uh, living entities uh, because they have, that is why the chain is broken. They, we forget even one day before what we learned. So that is the reason uh, to re-establish the Dharma. We, we forget in course of time. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Can we have another definition of Sanatan Dharma? And Dharma is occupation, Maharaj. Yes, right. Dharma That's... means occupation and uh, Sanatan means eternal. So our uh, Sanatan Dharma is to serve Krishna, to keep ourselves occupied in service of Krishna. The eternal occupation of the soul, right? Yes. Our eternal yes. occupation of the soul in relation to the Supreme Lord. Okay, that is actually Sanatan Dharma. And then compare the results of following Varnashram Dharma with the result of Sanatan Dharma. We compare the result following Varnashram Dharma. Do we get benefit? Do you remember? What were some of the benefits we got from following Varnashram Dharma? Yes, Maharaj. By following Varnashram Dharma, we can get elevated to the you know, next level. Like, uh, you know, also we can become Brahmin and uh, other higher. Okay. Yes, we might be elevate. We may elevate our status in, the, in this material world. Yes. In this life, then, we can elevate our status. Yes. Any other benefits of Varnashram? Maharaj, yes, so uh, by following Varnashram Dharma, we will be prevented of falling, uh, falling into the lower species, and then uh, we will, be, and then by even Brahmanas by following Varnashrama, the uh, killing sacrifice of the animal that uh, instead of going into the cycle of 84 lakh species, we will be directly getting a human birth. Well, you know, when you said. We, could, we protect ourselves from falling into the lower species. We didn't say that in relation to Varnashram Dharma. That was in relation to Sanatan Dharma. A little advancement, a little devotional service, that will save us from the greatest danger. But we didn't, we didn't speak about Varnashram Dharma in that way. 
right? Okay, Maharaj. But the benefit of following Varnashram Dharma, we spoke about, yes, what other things? Yes, right, elevation to higher planets, open the doors to liberation. Purification of senses. Purification of senses. I don't know about that. But remember we spoke about stepping stones. Stepping stones where? What are the purpose of the st stepping stones? Yes, to ink to help us to make spiritual advancement. Right. So that these kind of things are important for us. Help us to make spiritual advancement, elevation to higher status, gradual development of self-realization. A gradual development of self-realization. We said those were the benefits of Varnashram Dharma. What about the results of Sanatan Dharma? What did we say was the results of Sanatan Dharma? Yes, uh, Living materially, we can spiritualize, we can transcend. Elevate our consciousness to the yes. spiritual platform. Okay. Something else? From, uh, sinful reactions. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Yes. Freedom from sinful reactions. And then also Maharaj can save us from the most dangerous type of fear which is to uh, enter lower species of life like animals yes dogs. right protect us from falling into the lower species a little devotional service will save us from that danger yes okay understanding under what circumstances following Varnashram Dharma is necessary? When it's absolutely necessary, you have to do it. Who has to do it? Those who are not liberated. Yes, right, very good. Those who are not liberated, they must follow Varnashram Dharma. It's important for them. And what are the qualifications required for beginning the practice of Krishna consciousness? Sincerity. With references from Bhagavad Gita 326. So who was, who was referring to 326? Who remembers some references from there? About who can practice Krishna consciousness? And yes, can we have the quote from the, the Bhagavad Gita 326? The slightly developed Krishna conscious person may directly be engaged in service of the Lord. Who may be directly engaged in the service of the Lord? A slightly developed Krishna conscious person. A slightly developed how does a person, who, who is qualified to become slightly developed? Anyone? Who is willing to follow the instructions? Yes, well, yeah, we, we, we heard earlier, yeah. Anybody who does a little practice of devotional service, a little, a, even a slight practice, a little interest in the beginning, Jaipataka Swami describes how he became a devotee. He wanted to go to India and he'd come to San Francisco and he'd heard there was a Rati Atra festival, a festival of India. And so he went there to find out if he could help. And he got to the place where they were building the Rati Atra chariots. 
And this devotee, Jayananda Prabhu, said to him, he said, Oh, do you know how to use a hammer? <laughs> so he gave him a hammer. And he said his first service for Krishna was hammering nails, nails into the Rathiatra chariot. And so that was the beginning of his service for Krishna. For Krishna. He began his devotional service in that way. And many of us, of course, we had similar experiences. We come to the temple and we would do something. And maybe they ask us, can you, can you take the garbage out? Could you sweep the temple? Could you wash the pot or something like this, you know? And this is, this is the beginning of our practice of Krishna consciousness. So we're doing some punya karma. You could say agyata sukriti. Agya, unknowingly we're doing some devotional activity. And that's qualifying us to take up Krishna consciousness. Right? And one more. The, pract we explain, the practice of Krishna consciousness is transcendental to Varnashram Dharma. Right? It's above Varnashram Dharma. Who, who can do Krishna consciousness? Anyone, from any varna, from any ashram. Doesn't matter who they are, where they're coming from, they can take up Krishna consciousness. It doesn't depend on the varna or the ashram. Is it clear to everyone? I hope so. Here's a quote from Prabhupada. Therefore, this is the panacea. To engage everyone in Krishna consciousness, chanting Hare Krishna, he comes above the highest principle of Brahmanism. This is the greatest gift to the humanity, that even he is in the fallen condition, the most degraded position, he can be raised to the highest position simply by chanting. This is the only remedy. A lecture from Los Angeles in 1968 from Bhagavad Gita 3.18 to 30. Oh, this is the only remedy. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. All right, any questions? Anybody has any questions? Any challenges? Can I have a question? Yes, good. Yeah, um, we discussed that uh, <clears throat> the highest highest principle is to surrender to Krishna, and uh, not uh, anything else like ahimsa or uh, uh, things like that. So, uh, it is the highest principle for uh, like like all these principles can be ignored uh, or say highest principle is preaching also or is it the same thing with preaching Krishna consciousness or just surrender to Krishna your, your own self? Just surrender. <coughs> well, but Krishna, surrender to Krishna is the highest thing, yes. And by surrendering to Krishna, then all of the other things, like you spoke about ahimsa and maybe, you know, practicing celibacy or, you know, monavrat, all of these different things, they can all be related to the practice of Krishna consciousness. One who is Krishna conscious, one who is surrendered to Krishna, then he's automatically going to practice ahimsa. He's not going to go around killing creatures. Even when we pluck Tosi leaves, we offer a prayer to Tosi that, oh, please forgive me if I'm causing you any pain by plucking your flowers. So the, a devotee is very conscious of every living entity. We heard about Narada Muni coming to see Magrari, the hunter. Magrari was sweeping the insects out of the path. Previously he'd been a hunter and he was killing the animals and trapping them and causing them so much pain and they would die a slow and painful death. But after he became Krishna conscious, he, he couldn't even step on insects and he would sweep them out of the path. 
I had a, I had a very interesting experience. Uh, one time I was with one man, he was an American man, and he was from the, the Mormon church. So he didn't know I was a Hare Krishna. I wasn't in my devotee dress or anything. Anyway, I was talking to him. And so it happened, we were in a, a country in Asia, and then suddenly this big cockroach appeared. A big cockroach came out. And when he saw it, he jumped on it with his foot, he stamped on his with his foot, he stamped on it. And when he did that, I got I got a shock, you know. I, I, you know, I, I just I was so shocked that he did that. And he looked at me and he said, In your religion, you don't even kill insects. <laughs> you know, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> Anyway, he, he kind of understood that I was really shocked that he killed this cockroach, and he was surprised. But, you know, this is, this is devotee. You know, we like that. You know, we don't like to go around killing things. So we do practice ahimsa. Just by being Krishna conscious, we see Krishna in all living entities, and we're naturally conscious about them. Right? So these other qualities, the sub-religious principles, they all manifest, just like you know, being, clean, being clean. Initially, when we came to Krishna consciousness, we're not so clean. You know, we go to the toilet and we would never think of taking a shower or something. But after becoming devotees, you know, when you go to evacuate, then you want to take a shower immediately. But before, as non-devotees, you know, we never thought about that. It was not really the custom. And even in Western countries where it's cold, we, we, we have to shower every day. You know, it, it just becomes natural to a devotee. Yes, Maharaj. So, uh, yes, what you said is all true, but like Prabhupada made some changes, but Prabhupada was uh, definitely a great, you know, pure devotee. But if needed for preaching, uh, uh, can there be minor changes made or...? Well, yes, of course. I mentioned some changes which Prabhupada made. I said he crossed the ocean. He crossed the ocean. Sannyasis are not supposed to cross the ocean. And he allowed women to go on the altar and worship the deity. And uh, he allowed women's ashram even. The Brahmacharini Ashram. So he gave women an opportunity to take part in the Krishna conscious activities. He did make some changes. And Prabhupada talks about the details and the principles. The, prin <coughs> the principles have to be preserved, but the details can be adjusted. And details are like, you know, our principle is vegetarian, but whether you eat Indian food or Chinese food or Mexican food or Italian food, whatever, that's a detail, but it must be vegetarian. So we can adjust the details, but we don't adjust the principles. Yeah? Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, huh? thank huh? you. Yeah, anybody else has any other questions? Yes, Maharaj. yes, Prabhu, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, if uh, we can achieve our target by offenseless chanting only, why we should uh, preach about uh, burners from Dharma at this time? If we can if we can get perfection just simply by chanting, why are we preaching about Varnashram Dharma? The, pro the problem is not everybody can chant. Not everyone's able to take up the chanting process. People are, you know, people have some bad habits. They have, they have a different nature. Their psychophysical nature doesn't allow them to sit and chant. In Srila Prabhupada's time, in the beginning of our movement, there was this one man, one young man, who joined the movement. And he was there for some time, but then after a short time, he came to Prabhupada and he said, Swamiji, he said, I can't do this. He said, my father was a boxer. He said, I, can ju I cannot just sit here and chant Hare Krishna and hold these beats. 
And so Prabhupada said, well, then go then, you go. <laughs> Prabhupada said, so what can we do, you know? We cannot force people to stay in Krishna consciousness. We give everyone an opportunity. Not everyone's able to take up the opportunity. So chanting Hare Krishna, it, it's special. Not everyone's able to sit and chant and take pleasure in chanting. We know, of course, if they will do it, they'll be greatly benefited. But still, we don't find that it, there's not so many takers who are willing to just come here and take up the chanting process. Yeah? There's no doubt if they'll do it, they can go back to Godhead. But not everyone will do it. Some people have prejudices about these things. Oh, they, th they think this is religious. I, I'm not religious. I don't want to be religious. And they shy away from it. Anyway, we have to try, try our best to preach, to give the holy name. Even though they don't want to hear, we chant anyway. Yes? Any other questions? Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, just a quick question on clarification on Varnashram Dham and Sanatan Dham. And we just uh, try to understand the differentiation in the results we achieve from each. Maharaj, it looks like Sanatan Dham is an overarching principle. That's my eternal. Dharma, my, my, my duty. I am supposed to be a servitor of Krishna, I must serve Krishna. Uh, and Krishna is my master. So that's Sanatana Dharma, boxed on one side. But when we look at Varnashram Dharma, that's also coming from Vedas, Vedas coming from Krishna. Can we not say that Varnashram Dharma is a subset or the lower set of Sanatana Dharma itself? Mm, well, uh, they're on a very different platform. You see, the, the Varnashram Dharma is on the material platform. It's very much based on the material world, people's designations and so on. These positions which people have. And, and, well, not only positions, but ash occupations, ashrams, different natures people have. That's in the material world. But Sanatan Dharma is relating more to the soul, the, the nature of the soul, as a servant of Krishna, eternally a servant of Krishna. Varnashram Dharma is more the mind and body our psychophysical nature. But Sanatan Dharma is the nature of the soul. So by following Varnashram Dharma, well, we get benefit gradually. Gradually we can elevate ourselves. But Sanatan Dharma, for spiritual benefit, immediately we can feel the benefit, you can feel the results. You take up Krishna consciousness, you can immediately feel the change, the power of the chanting of the holy name and the practice of the discipline of Krishna consciousness. It's very powerful. Now, in Varnashram Dharma, it's a much more gradual, slow progress. So, Maharaj, are we saying Sanatana Dharma as Krishna consciousness? Yes, Sanatana Dharma is Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness. Yes. Thank you. Uh -huh. Hare Krishna. Yes, and then there's another question here. Some more people. Maharaj, could you please highlight about uh, Deva Varnashrama system? Daivi Varnashram. The Daivi Varnashram system is that we'll do whatever is required. We don't 
identify ourselves as belonging to any particular ashram or varna, but we will simply do whatever is required. It's all service for the Lord. Nobody is designated, no one's understood to be Brahman, Kshatri, Vaishya, Sur, but we'll, sim but we'll do all the different duties, regardless of our position. Whatever needs to be done, we'll do it. If in the Varnashram system, if you're a Brahmana, you're not going to clean. You know, you're, you're very restricted what you're going to do. But in Daivi Varnashram, <coughs> you can do everything for Krishna. All Can this. you say Iskon is a Daiva Varnashrama system? <coughs> oh yeah, yes. We practice Daiva Varnashram. We should do. Yes. Uh -huh. Our farms, devotees are there. You can see that sometimes the devotees are working in the fields and they're brahmanas and like that. They may be worshipping the deity in the morning. Then they go and work in the field, or they take care of the cows. That's Daiviva National. Yeah? Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yes, we have some, one more, another question here. Uh, Hare Krishna, uh, I just want to just... Uh, uh, conclude from uh, oh. that Varnash, we have to keep balance in between Varnashram and Sanatan Dharma because we have material body. So uh, we should, uh, I think so, this is the learning, Maharaj. Yes, because, yes, yes, we have to practice. We also respect Varnashram. We have material bodies. We're not liberated souls. <laughs> right? Yeah. We're trying to become liberated, but we're not fully liberated, so we do practice for Nashram. We follow the different Varnas and Ashram, we engage ourselves accordingly. Yes? So, without uh, following Varnashram, we can't directly uh, go for Sanatana, that means? No, we can. We can. We, externally, we engage in Varnashram, but we also practice Krishna Consciousness. We do have to practice Krishna Consciousness. But at the same time, externally we follow Varnashram, but internally we're engaging in Krishna Consciousness. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes? Hello, Guru. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Um, so just now, Maharaj, uh, we, you mentioned about the uh, principles of religion and uh, you, you heard one of them was mercy. And for that, Prabhupada said that, uh, you know, we should not, you no know, meat eating. So, and um, currently, like nowadays in the world, especially in places like America and all, there's this new philosophy and concept coming up that they get uh, humans, other people, to sign a contract and these humans agree that after they die, um, they will allow their body to be consumed for as food, so that you know you don't have to kill other animals and torture them. So people use this. Uh, they are saying that you know we are not torturing anyone, so it's not no one is getting hurt here. We are eating the dead bodies of other human beings, you know, and they agree to it. So how do we uh, you know uh, uh, challenge this argument, Maharaj? Well, dead bodies, you know, there are people like that. There's, you know, there's a religion called Parsi, and the Parsis worship fire, so they don't burn the bodies. They will offer the dead bodies to the vultures, and the vultures come and eat the dead carcasses, the dead bodies of people. And it's a Parsi religion. Uh, in Krishna consciousness, we do burn the dead bodies because... Well, the body's dead, it, it's, uh, and by the final rites, you see the actual cremation of the body, that detaches the soul and detaches the, all the people also from that body. The relatives and so on, who are related to the dead person, they will feel attachment to that dead body. 
but by the cremation, the actual act of the final rites, then that detaches them from it. And so we do have that tradition in the Vedic culture that the body should be burned or uh, sometimes the body is put into samadhi and sometimes very young children, they may be put onto the, the boat and they may be put on a banana boat down the Ganga, sometimes like that, you know. There are different ways of uh, preparing the, for the dead body, for the last rites of the person. But feeding the body, feed it, letting the dead body become food for another living entity, well, it's already there. If you bury the body, the body will become food for the insects, the worms. Within the body, there's intestinal worms and so on. They eat up the flesh of the body. If they put the body into the ground, like in Christianity or Islam, then the body is eaten by the different creatures, insects and so on, which are there in the earth. And so it does happen. But Maharaj, um, what's going on is, people are saying that um, this dead body, they are giving it as food for other human beings, for human consumption. They get the owner and the owner, you know, they sign a contract saying that after they die, they can, you know, their body can be used as food for the people and, you know, in this way they don't... Well, it's not food for people, it's not food for human consumption. It's not what, you know, that we, there's food in the mode of goodness, food in the mode of passion, and food in the mode of ignorance. So people are going to eat human flesh, that is food in the mode of ignorance. And by acting in the mode of ignorance, then they become more deeper entangled in the mode of ignorance. Next life they may become vultures. It's not what anything which we support. It's just people in the mode of ignorance who want to do this. To eat human flesh, that is not civilized. Okay, any other questions, Prabhu? Just one last question. Maharaj, you've already answered my question, but I just wanted to know, you just said three things, no? Food in the mode of goodness, ignorance, and one more thing, passion. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, food in the modes, right? So you eat human flesh, that's the darkest ignorance. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Maharaj, to say this, we say that our bodies, you know, they've been given to us by Krishna to serve the Krishna. So if we're trying to, you know, support these kind of arguments, it's like we are using our bodies for our own sense gratification. So there is no chance of, you know, elevation or, you know, anything in the next birth or whatever. So that's not supportive. Yeah. That's not civilized. That's definitely not civilized, right? We use our body for the service of Krishna and we eat food which is first offered to Krishna. That's important for us. Hmm? Okay, thank you, Maharaji. Hare Krishna. All right, so thank you very much. We'll finish here. And we'll be back next week. Was oh, that another question? Yes? No, no, no. No? Okay. So we'll finish, Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you, Maharaj. Go back to Brinda Ki. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.